Okay, we've heard quite a bit this morning. Um, I want to ask everyone to take a really deep breath right now. It's okay, everything is going to be all right. <laughs> um, and I'm going to say to our supporters and our board members um, and to our grantees here, uh, we're all going to make a difference. Um, I think we're going to come out of this energized to really make a difference. Um, so I have uh, the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Dr. William J. Perry. Uh, he is, was the uh, 19th Secretary of Defense. All of us know who he is. Uh, to governments all around the world, he is recognized for his extraordinary contributions to peace and security uh, throughout the world. To those of us in the peace and security community, our high esteem has only gone up for him because he has dedicated the last 10 years of his public life to educating everyday people about the dangers and the threats of nuclear weapons. <laughs> and, and personally, this is a real treat for me to be able to introduce him uh, because I, I've known Bill for, for 20 years. Um, and I thought about, we were just talking, this is actually the first time I've had the opportunity here in Washington to actually be in a program with him to introduce him or to talk with him about um, uh, ongoing issues. Uh, and I've done this in, let's see, we Beijing, Tokyo, Seoul, and even Pyongyang, but this is the first time in Washington, D.C. Because uh, Bill, for me, uh, is, has been... Um, and, I ha and Joe, I'm really sorry I'm going to have to say this. Where's Joe? He, jo uh, Bill is one of the best bosses I've ever had in my life. <laughs> okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay? I, I think you'll understand. Uh, so that's first. The best boss that I've ever had. One of the best bosses I've ever had. Yes, one. You remember that. The second is that he has been uh, a great mentor to me and then uh, a friend and a colleague. And always, as I thought about this, he has been, I think, a one-of-a-kind role model in terms of how one should lead a life in public service. Um, and I think specifically, and I think apropos to our time right now in this hyper-partisan world, how to best engage in very direct but civil discourse on very important issues. So everyone knows who Dr. William Perry is, and with that, I will end and introduce Dr. Perry. He'll make some remarks for us. Bill, please come up. Thank you, Philip, for that wonderfully warm introduction. Can you hear me all right? No. Is that better? Okay. So I celebrated my 90th birthday a few weeks ago. <laughs> I, never, I never expected to make it, and now that I'm here, I'm not sure I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and people have asked me, why in the world, at 90 years old, are you still plugging away at this problem? It's certainly not going to make any difference to me. But I do have eight grandchildren, and I do have three great-grandchildren. And I really would like to see them have some future in this planet, a future not marred by a nuclear war. So I've devoted the rest of my career to trying to explain to the world how dangerous this problem is and what we can do to try to avoid such a war. Today. I'm going to talk about one possible way of destroying our planet. This is a small scale way, and this is the North Korean War. This is a <clears throat> very sophisticated audience. I'm not going to give a speech to you today. Instead, I'm going to tell you about what I believe about North Korea and what conclusions I draw from that, hoping that you might want to draw the same conclusions. Uh, the first thing I believe is that they have about 20 or 30 nuclear weapons, some of them thermonuclear, and they have missiles to deliver these to South Korea and to Japan. 
I believe the purpose of these nuclear w weapons is to deter the United States from attacking North Korea. That is, to put it more bluntly from the way they see it, to c allow the regime to survive, to sustain the Kim dynasty. Now, I must say, I think this is a ruthless regime. I just as soon see it pass by the wayside, but not at the expense of a nuclear war. I believe that they will use these nuclear weapons only in response to an attack, a military attack by the United States. And if they use them, they can destroy Seoul and they can destroy Tokyo, among other things, resulting in many millions of deaths. We're not talking about the original Korean War, we're talking about many millions of deaths. We can avenge that action. We can destroy North Korea, but we cannot defend against it. If anyone thinks we are capable of defending, again, please bring it up in the question period, and I will disabuse you of that notion. <laughs> we cannot defend against it. We can avenge it. That is, we can add to the millions of deaths by killing millions of North Koreans. Because I believe that, I believe that we must do everything we can to ensure that that catastrophe does not happen. We do not have, we do not have a viable military option. And anybody that believes that, I would like to discuss that with them. We should not be threatening, especially be re -threat threatening a, re a decapitation strike against North Korea. <coughs> because what we think, some people in the United States seem to think that such a threat will intimidate North Korea. The real danger is it will stimulate them to take a preventive strike, to try to prevent our preemption. I believe we should get serious about diplomacy. I mean serious about diplomacy. And that's going to require some serious discussions with China before we start talking with North Korea, because we cannot do it by ourselves. It's not enough to point to China and say, you solved the problem. We've been doing that for years, unsuccessfully. Or them pointing to us and saying, you solved the problem. We have to get together and partner to solve this problem. Between the two of us, along with assistance from the South Korea and Japan, but certainly between, but primarily between the China and the United States, we can put together a diplomatic package strong in incentives and strong in disincentives. That is strong in carrots and sticks. It has become folklore in Washington that you cannot use diplomacy with North Korea. I dispute that. I spent a week of my time some years ago in Pyongyang engaging in diplomacy with North Korea. They're, you know, really people just like us, and you can talk with them and you can debate with them, you can listen to what they think they want, and you can actually arrive at agreements with them. And we did arrive at agreements back in 1999. Agreements that were that close to a final diplomatic agreement. In fact, the only thing that stopped that agreement, we finally reached an agreement in a very important date in history, which is October of 2000. What happened one month later was called an election, and the administration that made that agreement went out of power. Uh, President Clinton did not want to impose that agreement on the new administration, so we passed it on to them to conclude. And they decided instead to cut off all negotiations with North Korea, and for two years we didn't even talk with them. So that was a huge missed opportunity, I fear. But I bring up the point not to wring my hands about the missed opportunity, but really to make the point that, that diplomacy has been used and has been effective with North Korea, and I believe could be used again. Not the same diplomacy, not the same terms. The situation is very different today. When I was negotiating with them, I was negotiating to get them to agree not to develop a nuclear arsenal. Now they have a nuclear arsenal, so that it's a different situation. Getting them to agree to give up a nuclear arsenal they already have is a much steeper p diplomatic path to climb. And I believe that while we could do the first agreement without China, we definitely need China as a partner to negotiate with them today. 
What can Congress do about this? You've had, heard from many congressmen today. I think the first and best thing they can do would be to pass the Conyers bill. It doesn't seem likely today that that's going to pass. But things could change. And in the meantime, the minimum the Ed Conyers has accomplished by proposing this bill is to stimulate a sensible and important dialogue about North Korea. So I celebrate Ed for putting this bill before the Congress. He has opened a new and important discussion, and it inconceivably could lead to that bill being passed. What can you do about it? I have no better answer to that than what you heard earlier today from Adam Smith, which is study the problem, get the message out, and work at it. That may seem like a feeble response to such an important problem, but this is a democracy, and that's the response that is open to you, that's available to you, and you should take full advantage of it. You have an organization in plowshares which you can rally you together on this issue. And no voice on this subject is more thoughtful or more important than the voice of plowshares. This is the main point I wanted to make to you today. We're going to talk about it more, but I also want to just pause for a moment to reflect on a completely different problem, which is the possibility of the United States responding to a false alarm. It's a problem that most people don't think about. In fact, it's a problem better not thought about in some ways. I cannot put it out of my mind because I actually was on the receiving end of a false alarm at one time in my life, and it changed forever my way of thinking about nuclear dangers. Let me just digress for a moment to describe that to you. At the time, it was a long time ago, 1979, but I, I remember it as well as if it had happened last night. I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering at the time. And I got a telephone call that woke me at 3 o'clock in the morning. And when I sleepily picked up the phone, the voice on the other end identified himself as the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. And the first thing he told me was his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States, on the way. And for one horrifying moment, I believed we were about to see the end of our civilization. He quickly, happily, quickly explained to me he had already concluded it was a false alarm. And he was calling me. Why was he calling me? I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. <laughs> He's calling me too. What the hell had gone wrong with this computer? He knew it was an error. He believed it was an error, but, he did, but the computer seemed to be operating properly. Well, I could not answer his question that night. It took us two days of study to figure out what, in fact, had happened. It was human error. When the, watch, when the shift changed that night, the new computer operator, instead of putting the operating tape in the computer, mistakenly put in a training tape. And so what was happening was a perfectly believable, realistic scenario. It was designed to be a realistic scenario. What saved us that night was we had a particularly intelligent, thoughtful, responsible watch officer. He did not call the president and wake him up and tell him this. He called me instead. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine now that the president had received this call at 3 o'clock in the morning, had been told he had six, seven, eight minutes to decide whether to launch our ICBMs or let them be destroyed in their silos. What a decision, what a decision for anybody to make. People focus now on, they would not, would not like President Trump to make that decision. I don't want any person had to be confronted with that kind of a decision. There are various ways of uh, getting out of that dilemma. Certainly the bill proposed by Ed Markey and, and uh, Congressman Liu are very relevant to that issue. Again, whether or not that's passed, it has stimulated debate. It has brought the attention of this problem to the public, and that was very worth doing. And maybe even we would be so lucky as to have actually see it passed as the law of the land. 
There are other things we can do, too. We can phase out our ICBMs, which I propose, because the problem does not lie with them deterrent in general. It lies specifically with the ICBMs. It's only the ICBMs that are targeted, and therefore the ones that stimulate the need to launch our missiles right away. We can revise our launch on warning policy and should do that. And we should review the whole idea of what during the Cold War we called boob, bolt out of the blue. The whole problem stems from the belief that we had during the Cold War, which we have not abandoned today, that the first the Soviet Union, now Russia, would want to, would think it was sensible to, make a surprise disarming attack on the United States. That is nonsense. It was nonsense during the Cold War. It's even greater nonsense today. But our whole policies have been oriented on the belief that, indeed, is what the problem is. I think I've said enough to spoil your whole day for you. <laughs> but we'd like to talk a little further about the North Korean problem. And Philip and I are going to have a dialogue on that. And then we're going to invite your participation. I thank you very much. By the way, after that introduction that Philip gave me, I've decided I want, I want to take him with me to introduce me everywhere I go. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Test, one, two, three, anything? No? Now, can you hear me without the mic? I think you should be able to. So the pressure was on because Bill told me that he wanted a good introduction. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I'm going to ask a few questions here to sort of stimulate a little bit more thought, and then we'll open it up for, for people. Joe, how much time do we have about? Uh, we're going to have lunch That's whenever you're done. Okay. So the <laughs> 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 we, are, we are between them and lunch. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Okay, well, well, we'll see how, how, how we do here. I wanted to talk with you about um, this notion. One of the things that we've been talking about is that there's real no military option, and that's what you said at the very beginning. Um, I understand that you took people through some granularity here in terms of what military, what led you to that conclusion, and I think it's worthwhile for you as a former Secretary of Defense who has studied these options, who looked at that in 1994 and continued to look at that since that time and when we were in the, in the Perry process, um, what does that look like right now in 2017 and why do you have that conclusion? I think it's worthwhile for people to understand what that looks like. Now we had a military option in 1994 when I was Secretary of Defense. I had sitting on my desk a plan to use cruise missiles to destroy the nuclear facility at Yongbyon, and it could have been enacted. We put that on the very back, as, as people say, all, everything's on the table. We put that at the very back end of the table and put the front end of the table with diplomacy, which was successful and did lead to the agreed framework. But that was a viable option. We could have destroyed the entire facility at Yongbyon which would have set the, the nuclear program back at least 10 years, maybe longer. Uh, but the reason we had it in the back of the table instead of the front of the table is we believed that it was very likely that while the, the action itself could be accomplished with very few casualties, that it was very likely to lead to a military attack on North Korea and South Korea. And therefore, it was likely to lead to many hundreds of thousands or even millions of casualties in, among the South Koreans. To refresh you, those of you who are not aware of it, the Seoul is within about a 45 minute drive from the DMZ, where the North Koreans kept in those days almost a million troops. So while we had a very strong defense in North Korea at that time, it was not at all clear we could keep the North Korean army from reaching Seoul. So we saw, very, we saw that any war started we would win, 
whatever wind means, but there would be hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of categories in solar. For, th for that reason, we put that as very far at the back of the table. Uh, the only reason it was on the table at all was because we believed that the consequences of North Korea getting a nuclear capability were equally serious. Yeah. Okay, so we were talking, uh, you know, it seems to be there's a lot of discussion now, or, and Joe alluded to it earlier about the winds of, I guess, war to some degree. Um, and there seems to be a normalization, of <laughs> like so many other things that are happening now in Washington, about the idea of a limited unilateral strike. Um, and part of what we're hearing for, and I'm going to pull on the thread that you talked about, is missile defense. Uh, there seems to be this notion, a canard out there, that we're protected. And so I know you've studied this problem very carefully. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Well, there have been a lot of criticism of our missile defense if they don't work, that is, they don't live up to their specifications. And there's some evidence that perhaps supported that argument. But I take the position that even if they work exactly according to their specifications, even if they do work, they don't work. Why is that? It's because any missile defense system can be saturated. We're going to have so many missiles there, and we can fire against so many in incoming warheads. So how do you saturate a missile defense so it won't work? Uh, the first thing that you do is you put more missiles in the air than, than they have de uh, defensive missiles. Uh, we believe that North Korea has maybe 100 to 200 missiles. They don't have all have to have nuclear weapons in them to perform the role of saturating the defense. So you can put three or four nuclear warheads and missiles and another 20 or 30 or 40 missiles in the air to go along with them. That's the brute force way of doing it. The more subtle way of doing it is to put decoys on the missiles. If you think that North Korea is not sophisticated enough to, to build decoys, then you also have to believe they're not sophisticated enough to build thermonuclear weapons. They are sophisticated enough to build decoys and they're very relatively simple to build. So you saturate the defense with not, with maybe tens of missiles, but hundreds or even thousands of decoys. Uh, so even if our system works exactly as designed and against to its specifications, it's, it will be saturated. So we cannot defend Seoul, no matter, with certainly with the number of systems we have there, even if we doubled or tripled the number of defensive systems there, we cannot defend Seoul. I hate to tell the people in Seoul that, but we ought to be clear-eyed about what we can and what we cannot do. What about uh, the ground-based missile defense for the United States? How, how do you feel about that? The same way. It's a snare and a delusion. It detracts us from doing the things we, can, we should be doing to prevent the war rather than trying to defend against it. Anybody that thinks you can defend against a massive nuclear attack is not studied the problem. That's all I can say. It's not popular. You can, the best thing you can say about the defense there is it might give the person who's thinking of launching an attack against you, particularly if it's a small scale attack, some pause. But to believe that we could defend the United States, particularly against a large scale attack, is a fantasy. Let's then talk um, a little bit about how we prevent um, us to getting the situation, um, uh, you know, in a, upward or downward spiral, depending on how we talk, and, and, and of, of threats and all that. So let's talk a little bit about China. Um, the way I understand is you say China is sort of a necessary party in all this, but it's not sufficient. They're, they alone cannot solve this. What kind of discussion do you think the United States has to have with China in order to get some movement in the way that we think we need to get some movement? Yeah. I've argued we, we do have a diplomatic option in North Korea, but that it requires China. So I think our first step is not dialogue with Pyongyang, but dialogue with Beijing. And we have to, in our dialogue with them, we have to agree on several things. First of all, what is the threat? What is the danger? China has to be concerned about a war on the Korean Peninsula. They have to be concerned about the possibility of Japan or South Korea going nuclear. Those are very real possibilities today, and China is smart enough to see those. So we had to start off by saying, here are the problems you face today. What can we do to lower the, lower the probability of those occurring? So then the next thing we need to do is 
understand what their fears are about our role in the Korean career today. Uh, diplomats are believed to be people who have golden tongues. But a real diplomat, a good diplomat, has golden ears. He listens. <laughs> he listens to what the other side say. He understands what their problems are and tries to relate his diplomatic proposals to their problems, the way they're solving their problems. So in the case of China, it's easy to listen to them and understand why they are concerned about a war in the Korean Peninsula, why they're concerned about Japan and South Korea going nuclear. That's easy. What's a little more subtle is why are they concerned about us? They are not happy with the prospect of a united Korea under South Korea, an ally of the United States, and the United States having troops up along the Yalu River. So we'd have to convince them that we're not going to take advantage of that situation if it occurs. We'd have to convince them that, in fact, if we had a united Korea, our reason for having any troops in Korea goes away. We have military 30,000 forces in Korea today. At one time, we had 40,000 forces for the sole purpose of defending South Korea against a North Korea attack. So if we did not have that problem anymore, then the need for having the troops would go away. So we'd have to have that kind of a discussion with China. And if we could be convinced them that the downsides are figured are not going to happen, then we have a very good prospect, I think, of getting them to join arms with us in a proposal to North Korea. A proposal with a, a diplomatic proposal would be very strong in incentives, which we in South Korea and Japan can offer, and very strong in disincentives, which North Korea, uh, which China can offer. We have no disincentives in our diplomatic package except the threat to go to war, which is not a credible threat to North Korea. China has a uh, very real prospect of cutting, of cutting off the food and fuel they supply, which would be very, very damaging to North Korea. And so if we could find a way of easing their mind on, on uh, how we're going to take advantage of the situation to their disadvantage, then I think we could maybe put a diplomatic package together. So a diplomatic package is possible. I just don't see the prospect of this administration having the wits to follow that course. I'm, okay. I'm sorry to say I'm not optimistic about that, but we do know the possibility of putting that kind of a package together. Okay, so. Um, with respect to the diplomacy and objectives here, uh, you pointed out in your remarks um, the 1990s and particularly when you know we were in Pyongyang and we were talking about a particular deal uh, on missiles, and I know Bob Einhorn was here as well who was involved in this. Um, very different world from what it is now. Um, so let's just talk hypothetically that this administration is open to something like that. Mm -hmm. What are the steps and, and what are the sort of objectives that we should be thinking about um, that would lay the groundwork for some kind of uh, a deal to work out? So at, at this point, we're not really sure, no one is really sure whether or not they actually have the capability um, to, to hit the United States with a thermonuclear device. I mean, um, there's some dispute within the community um, but, you know, people say it's just really a matter of time if they don't have it already. Well, first let me say that we should not be so obsessed about whether they can strike the United States. We know they can strike Seoul. We know they can strike Tokyo. We know they can kill 10 million people doing that. They are allies. Why should we not be concerned about that, even if they never could strike the United States? So. I'd like to put off the question of when and whether they're going to strike the United States and say we have compelling reasons today to try to prevent the catastrophe from happening to Seoul or Tokyo. So what do you think then um, is going forward? Uh, what do you see happening? Um, if the administration is not disposed to um, any kind of negotiations and talking. I mean, you know, I think you and I agree that um, they're doing things that they should do in terms of the deterrence um, and more defensive. They are putting more pressure on North Korea with the sanctions, but what's really missing now is the fact of a dialogue that's happening and the fact that the only American that I know of that has met Kim Jong-un is Dennis Rodman, right? <laughs> um, 
So there's that lack of convert dialogue that's going on, and it seems that from what we're hearing that that sort of has been cut off for the time being. If you could look into your crystal ball, what are you afraid of? How is this all going to unfold? Well, let me say again, I do not believe the North Koreans are going to make an unprovoked attack against Seoul, against Tokyo, or the United States, any country. They are, this is not Al-Qaeda. It's not ISIS. They're not seeking martyrdom. They're not, seek, they're not suicidal. They want to sustain the regime. So if they attack anyone, if they make an unprovoked attack against any, ourselves or allies, they are inviting their own de destruction, and they know that. So we have to start off by saying they're not looking to start a war. So what could start a war? If they see their regime threatened by our actions, I mean, we're trying to sustain the regime, if they see them threatened by their actions, then they might do, start a war. So we have to be careful, not only about what we do, but about what we say. And when we make statements that suggest that we're considering a preemptive decapitation strike, we think we're doing that to intimidate them. What we're really doing is setting in their mind the thoughts that they're about to go, so they might as well go out in a blaze of glory. So the only such circumstance in which I can see them using their nuclear weapons are if they see the regime is about to go under anyway, and then they want to have a Korean Armageddon. They want to take everybody else down with them. And we have to be careful not to put them in that position, I think. Okay, so let me just switch gears a little bit. It's all sort of related. Um, we have the uh, Trump administration is proposing over a trillion dollar rebuild of the nuclear arsenal. This is something you've been very outspoken about. Um, if you were running what we call the nuclear posture review, um, are there, what, can you talk about what nuclear systems you'd want to replace and which ones you wouldn't? Well, I would, first of all, phase out our ICBMs for the reasons that I gave during my talk, because the ICBMs are the unique weapon we have that make us susceptible to a responding to a false alarm. If we get an alarm, we can ride it out. We can ride it out, except for the ICBMs. So therefore, we'd have, there, it, it eliminates the danger that we would falsely respond to a false alarm. And I just want to repeat again, responding to a false alarm, false response. We're not talking about a million deaths or 10 million. We're talking about the end of our civilization. That's what's at stake here. And the most obvious way that can happen today is by, a false re is by falsely responding to an alarm. And why people are not concerned about that, I don't understand. I know why I'm concerned about it, because I've lived through it once. And I try to communicate that to people <coughs> so that they may vicariously benefit from my experience. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a not a high probability. You know, maybe it's only one chance in 100. But we're talking about consequences being the end of civilization. So we have to take it seriously. And I, th I just don't think we do. The, I have supported and the bill by Lou and Markey because I believe that it not only addresses that question, but it raises the issue in people's mind. It makes them, under makes them understand <coughs> that this is an important issue they need to pay attention to. So why don't we go ahead and open it up for questions generally. I didn't touch on Iran at all, and that's free game, I think, and <coughs> other questions, so. Uh, I just want to say I associate myself with the comments of the panel here on Iran. I thought it was a very thoughtful okay, discussion yeah. of that problem. I don't think I have much to add to what they were saying. Okay, <coughs> questions in the back? And if you could identify yourself, and what was, Kelsey, what were her three rules? I like that. I got to remember that. Ask the question, keep the short, and identify yourself. And I work with Kelsey, so I absolutely need to uh, uh, yes. adhere to that principle. <laughs> I'm Kingston Reef uh, with the Arms Control Association. Dr. Perry, uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to and learn from you. Tomorrow, uh, October 27th, is the 55th anniversary of Black Saturday, uh, the most dangerous day of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and arguably the closest the world has ever come to the use of nuclear weapons since the end of World War II. You had a small role as a participant in the crisis in terms of evaluating some of the initial 
intelligence photographs of the Soviet missile deployments. And I was wondering if you could share with us some lessons that you think uh, there are from the missile crisis for uh, the current challenge we're facing vis-a-vis -vis North Korea for good or for ill. Thank you. Yeah, I was not in, the, not in the government at the time, but I was considered, rightly or wrongly, to be an expert on Soviet missiles. And so I was called back to be part of a small team to analyze the data that was intelligence coming in every day and preparing a report to go on President Kennedy's desk first thing in the morning to guide him in his decisions and actions. So I was right in the middle of it, and I knew exactly what was going on. And I believed then that every day I went into that analysis center was going to be my last day on Earth. That's what I thought about the Cuban Missile Crisis at the time. President Kennedy, after it was over, said that he thought the probability of that leading to a nuclear war was about one chance in three, one in three, which is pretty scary when the consequence is the other end of it, as I said, the end of civilization. But Kennedy's statement was optimistic because he didn't know when he made that statement some things that we now know. He didn't know that at that time that the Soviet already had tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba with the authorization of the commanders to use them without reference to Moscow. So if Kennedy had accepted the unanimous recommendation of his Joint Chiefs of Staff, which was to invade Cuba with conventional forces, our troops would have been decimated on the beachhead and a general nuclear war would surely have followed. So we can only wonder why Kennedy did not follow the joint recommendation, the combined recommendation of his Joint Chiefs of Staff. Had he followed them, we would have surely had a nuclear war. Uh, he did not know that the Soviets had submarines escorting the ships who were carrying missiles to Cuba and that the submarines had nuclear torpedoes. And that one of our destroyers, not knowing that either, was dropping depth charges on that submarine. And the skipper of the submarine was prepared to launch a nuclear torpedo at that destroyer, which in itself would have brought about a nuclear war. The Soviets had a policy then that it took two out of three on the ship to decide to launch a nuclear torpedo, and the other two uh, commanders voted against it. It was that back place. One person different would have, made ch would have changed the decision. So we were amazingly close to a civilization-ending nuclear war in Cuba, even closer than I realized at the time, because I didn't know some of those things either. A very scary situation. It, but I want to emphasize one very important point. Neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev wanted a nuclear war. In spite of that, we almost blundered into one. We almost blundered into it. And the danger today, I think, is the same. It's not a danger of Kim Jong-un launching an attack or the United States launching an attack or Vladimir Putin launching an attack. It's a danger that we will blunder. We blundered into a nuclear war. But that was a very, very, very real danger in the Cold War. In the Cold War, we always thought that the danger was that the Soviet Union was going to conduct this surprise attack on us, the bold Oliver Blue. And all of our policies, all of our weapons programs, so on, were based on responding to that assumed threat. That was never the threat. The threat was always that we would blunder into a nuclear war, and that threat was almost realized during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have a question over here. Uh, Jessica Matthews from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, Bill, the, the North Koreans have been talking forever about the fact that we're technically at war and that that makes them frightened. Um, and it's certainly a first rule of diplomacy that you don't spend a bargaining chip until you're going to get something for it. Uh, but holding on to this bargaining chip until we get something for it may mean that we never actually play it. Uh, that, th and we don't believe we're still at war with North Korea. What, what are your thoughts about um, offering them something for free? Yeah. That is uh, um, ending the armistice and signing a peace treaty. When Philip and I went to Pyongyang in 1999, we had four days of very detailed discussions with North Korean leaders. And I was surprised, really, at what I heard. And I came away with a different assessment of North Korea than when I went there. Uh, we were talking about 
we were making economic incentives to them, offering economic incentives, which they were happy to take, but that never was the highest priority with them. So I came away from those talks believing that their number one objective, their number one objective was a sustaining the Kim regime, sustaining the Kim dynasty. Their number two objective was gaining international respect and international recognition. And number three was economic, and number three was way down there. So at any time we would offer anything to them and they dealt with the first or the second, we got a lot of interest and a lot of response. And on the economic, they were willing to pocket it, but that wasn't what was driving them. Now, to get to your point, Jessica, one of the things we, did, we were offering them was the uh, signing a, a peace agreement with them, ending the Korean War. Very interesting, that very, it was a big deal with them. I, I can say that was with high level confidence. A second thing we were offering them was some kind of security assurances from the United States. Now you may dismiss security assurances so many words, but they were very interested and very positive about that. And the third thing we offered them they were very interested in was diplomatic recognition. So we set up first an embassy, I mean first an intersection in Pyongyang and then an embassy. And those are the three things of all the things we talked about that were highest on their list. Now to get specifically to your question, should we offer it for free? Why not? Uh, it's, it costs us nothing really. And uh, I think yes, I think we should do it maybe as a way of breaking the ice and getting something going. But we should understand when we deal with them what they value, what's important to them. And uh, those are the three things that I found were the, by, by all odds the most important. And we could reproduce those in a neg negotiation today. Today, I would want, if I, the, the security assurances, which are a little flaky when you offer them. I mean, you say them, then you change your mind later. But today, if we were doing a joint discussion with the Chinese, we could have American security assurances countersigned by the Chinese. That would be a very smart way, I think, of putting more emphasis on it and putting more significance in the mind of the North Koreans. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Mr. Secretary, Doyle McManus from the Los Angeles Times. Uh, the administration in, on North Korea appears to have drawn a red line around the deployment or testing of an ICBM with a usable, survivable nuclear warhead, although their red lines are difficult to pin down in practice. Kim Jong-un has reacted to threats uh, in the past uh, few years simply by forging ahead steadily and testing one device after another. Uh, d is, how likely is that scenario that Kim Jong-un will uh, continue that pattern, uh, deploy or test an ICBM with a warhead? That's part one. Part two is, in the past, President Trump has issued threats, but has sometimes backed down with them when someone constructed an escape ramp, gave him half a loaf. Uh, different situations, of course, he threatened to withdraw from NATO, he threatened to, uh, to uh, walk away from NAFTA, very different situations. But if you were in the unhappy position of being on H.R. McMaster's staff at this point and trying to construct an exit ramp for a president who believes he has drawn a red line, what might you suggest? <laughs> Two comments on that. Uh, the first is a general comment. The worst thing we can do in diplomacy is make empty threats. Make empty threats. That's very, very uh, counterproductive. We have, and my comment, criticism of the administration is bipartisan on that because we have both the Bush administration and the Obama administration made empty threats. And now the Trump administration is following that, unfortunate lead. So no empty threats, please. It's uh, very counterproductive. A second is what do we mean when we say we're drawing a red line? Does it mean we're going to conduct a military attack on North Korea if they do that? I don't think so. So I take the red line statement as another empty threat. I think it would be very much to our advantage to find a way of discouraging North Korea from conducting the tests you talk about. But I don't think just threatening them, which is what we're doing right now, is the way to go about that. Last question. 
uh, Stephen Young with the Union Concerned Scientists. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, as always. You're, you're one of my heroes in life. Um, a question about blundering into nuclear war. Um, say, for example, North Korea shoots down a U.S. aircraft, a military or conventional commercial, uh, and President Trump decides this is too much and he wants to attack them right now with nuclear weapons. How does it happen? Is the Secretary of Defense in the loop, or does he make a phone call, it goes forward no matter what? How does, what's, the, what's the exact, exact whole process for the President to order a nuclear strike? Did you get that question? No. I, I didn't quite get the question. No. Go ahead. Sorry. So if, Mr. if President Trump decides he wants to order a nuclear strike in response to some action by North Korea, how does he actually do it? Is were, When you were Secretary of Defense, were you in line of command? Would he order you to order a nuclear strike? And would you follow that order? Or how, how does the process actually work for the President to order a nuclear strike? Is it, is it his phone call and it goes? Or how does the process happen? I, President Trump. Trump will want to conduct a nuclear strike. That's the question. Nuclear strike, yeah, Jacob? Yeah, nuclear strike. Uh, I understand that question. How does that work? Logistically. Uh, he is, is set up so that he can consult with his national security advisors, Secretary of Defense, National Security, and uh, so on. But he doesn't have to. He can, by himself, one person, order the strike. And it's so that. It's so ordered, so done. It's a very bad system, and one of the advantages of President <laughs> one of the advantages of President Trump being the president is it's called attention to a system which is bad. Whoever is president, uh, the Marky Lou bill is trying to address that issue. It's one way of addressing the issue. More more needs to be done beyond that, but that is a very important first step. As a minimum, it calls attention to the issue. But the simple answer to your question is if President Trump wants to order a nuclear strike, he picks up his, if he, he, he gets his uh, football and presses the button and it's done. And that's a system that is very, very bad system. One of the advantages of President Trump being <laughs> president is it calls attention to just how bad the system is. And maybe we can find, maybe we can take that lemon and squeeze and get lemonade, we can actually use the occasion to find a way of changing that system altogether. Okay, Dr. Perry, thank you very much. On behalf of Plowshares Fund and Board of Directors, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service, and uh, you're a national treasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bill, thank you.